Good morning. It is 45 degrees. Everything is wet from the big thunderstorm last night. And I'm here to discover that the uh, primary museum and bookstore are closed. Oi. I'm staying on top of a sort of a mountain just north of the primary parts of the park. And the storm came overhead last night, wind whistling, rain beating down, and I was kind of afraid for the car. But, uh, I basically ended up with a free car wash, so that's nice. Now I'm going to visit the Spruce Tree House, if they'll let me in this early in the morning, before I go to the Cliff Palace tour that I've reserved at nine. Uh, more things that need to be on the park brochure. Well, on the plus side, get my first view of those staggering ruins. Wow. I cannot wait to go climb down and see that for real. Alright, well the original plan was to go see the uh, Farview dwellings this morning, but it turned out the road was closed, so the backup plan was to go see this spruce house, which is closed. So the backup backup plan is going to be to drive along the, uh, the Mesa View trail, because apparently there's plenty of ruins you can see from there, and just kind of while away the time until I can actually go take the Cliff Palace tour. Good to have a backup backup plan, but kind of sad that I need one. All right, well, it turns out Mesa Top Loop is closed for construction. Another thing that's not listed on any brochure. Um, you know, if I'd known the whole park was gonna be closed, I would have uh, I would have not gotten up so bloody early. My first instinct is this is what I get for coming so deep into off season, but it really isn't. It's October 3rd and uh, like, if you're still gonna let me reserve tour tickets, you should let me do the rest of it, you know? Uh, no use crying over spilled Mesa Verde. The backup backup plan has failed, which means I just have nothing to do for the next hour and a half. I'm gonna try to make the best of it, but I really think whoever is running this national park is dropping the ball. So over there, about two segments down from the top of the ridge, there's a cliff dwelling called the House of Many Windows. This whole canyon is full of cliff dwellings, the most famous being the Cliff Palace, which is almost directly below me, and that's what I'll be visiting at nine. And over there, barely even visible, probably not visible on camera because of the sun glare, is the Hemingway House. It's a little cluster of uh, stacked dwellings right beneath the top of that overhang in the middle of the camera view kind of far away to see it but they do look like they're two or three stories tall so that's interesting back to the backup plan when everything else was closed i figured screw it i got some time so i went north back up to farview and lo and behold the gate is now open uh, so i'm gonna do this now cool cool there's a silver lining don't mind my stunning park job okay this is what I came here for. This is the Far View House, built around AD 1000, so predating the big cliff dwellings that we're going to see later. Here's what it looks like from above. Apparently it had over 40 rooms just on the ground floor, and it's hard to tell how tall it would have been, but likely multiple stories. Look at this huge kiva. Wow. So this community would have started around 800 AD, which predates the cliff dwellings by a couple hundred years or more. Uh, they were primarily farmers up here on top of the mesa, and they built these large Puebloan type structures, of which there are several along this trail. This one is called the Pipe Shrine House. They call it that because apparently in one of those kivas, they found several uh, decorated pipes and interpreted it as a shrine. Here's the Coyote Village. This place started around AD 975, but was built up substantially at the same time period that the, uh, the bigger cliff dwellings were being built. There's multiple kivas here, you can see. I'm 
told one of them has a tunnel leading into the main tower. I'm thinking it's that hole in that one. But it is hard to tell because I can't actually go inside there for all the signs. Right now it's so cold and quiet. You can imagine this place in its prime. Must have been a nice place to call home. These trails are long and I'm short on time. Oh boy, this is a big one. They call it the Farview Reservoir. Excavations show that it was once deeper and that for much of the year water would pool in the bottom. It's thought that it would have been a couple phases of construction and a large community project from multiple regions to set this thing up. I mean, this whole area is very dry. You got all these trees that are primarily adapted to surviving in dry, sort of semi-arid conditions. The people here were actually dry farmers where they'd pretty much just plant the corn and uh, rely on the, the rain to take care of it. So I can see why collecting water and keeping it around was important. Where else would you get it up here? This one is sheltered. This is the Megalith house. This is much smaller than some of the other ones. And it's thought it would have been for one single extended family. Large parts of it actually remain unexcavated in order to preserve them for the future. Uh, man, running up here in this, uh, this thin air. Uh, I guess these folks were probably adapted to it, but I'm certainly not. What a lifestyle. But yeah, they called it Megalith House, because if you look down at the base, you can see that there were some very large rocks placed at those locations which at the time was considered unusual to do, but after some more excavations, they figured, yeah, see these especially, um, after some time and other excavations, they figured that lots of folks were doing it just because it provided a more stable foundation, and, you know, you need less other kinds of rocks that way. Oh, you can tell it's early. I have not seen another soul since I got here, and I've seen four of these, uh, these ruins so far. Final ruin up here in Farview is this, the Farview Tower. It's got two kivas here, plus it's thought there would have been a larger one over there that remains unexcavated. It's pretty small, but at the time this tower, one, probably would have been taller. And two, there would have been a lot less trees in this area because they'd be uh, farming. So maybe this would have offered a nice viewpoint, maybe even seeing as far as the edge of the mesa. I gotta wonder how many faces looked through that little door. What language did they speak? What did they say? What were their lives like? Archaeologists do their best, but a thousand years ago is a long time. Off to the Cliff Palace tour. Uh, when I got back to the parking area for Farview, there was a bus there, and the tour that was in that bus had already gone off down the path, but the bus driver was still there, and I chatted with him, his name was Tom, very nice, down-to-earth guy, and uh, he told me about another site that's on sort of an unlabeled side road from here that's really well preserved and that you can actually go climb around in, and most of the, uh, most of the Mesa Verde literature doesn't talk about. So I'm definitely going to check that out after Cliff Palace. Uh, he also confirmed my theory that the National Park Service is dropping the ball about having so many things closed because I am apparently far from the only person who has complained about that. Uh, so, yeah, at least I don't have to blame myself for prepping poorly. And there's the Cliff Palace. Gonna see it up close pretty soon. But from up here, it's spectacular. It's the size of all those other sites I've seen combined. Bye. It's apparently a nest of white-throated swallows up inside the very upper chambers, which would have served as the granaries back in the day. I wonder if occasionally they find old corn to eat. And there's a nest of other tourists looking awful jealous up there. Hundred twenty to 150 people used to live here. So, about the population of a small downtown tower. 
Honestly, this feels spacious after that. To look at this kiva, apparently the ventilation system consisted of, there's a fire pit right there, and here is a shaft for air, so when it would get too hot inside, air would be pulled down the shaft, and then it would run up against that flat rock and be forced to spread out around the entire thing. That's really cool. There's also a couple other doorways that go to other kivas or up into this tower. So this was definitely a well-used community space. Here's where that entrance comes out. And look, the same ventilation system still present. It's much more interesting seeing these kivas after having stayed in the Hogan because the uh, roofing system was apparently very similar, so it's very easy to uh, visualize what that would have looked like from inside. I don't think that's the original storage container. The path that we came down was uh, cut by the CCS back in the 30s, but the way that we're heading back up is actually one of the original paths up from the village to the uh, the cornfields up on the mesa. And as you can see, it's a little bit windier. Do you want to go up first, just man? <laughs> it's okay. This, is cool. uh, this feels like somebody took some of those divots at arches and turned them up to eleven. Look at this thing. What? Mini arches. And an original National Park Service ladder. Amazing, it's still here after all these years. So it's 9.47, and I've done just about everything left to do over here on the Chapin Mesa. I'm gonna go check out the, uh, the spot the, that I was talking about earlier, and then I'm going to uh, head over to the other mesa, uh, Weatherill, where the Longhouse is. Yeah, this, uh, this one was the largest ancestral Pueblo site, and apparently the second largest one is Longhouse, which serendipitously, I also have a ticket to. So cool, <laughs> hitting up gold and silver. And here it is, the Cedar Tree Tower. And just like Tom said, I am here alone. I heard, not sure if it's true, that this actually showed up when a number of years ago, these pinion pines were all burned in a big fire. And uh, they came out here, and lo and behold, there was another tower up here on the mesa. Uh, speaking of which, I've also heard from the ranger that uh, the pinion pines up here are dying, that the, uh, the new saplings aren't taking hold because it's getting drier and drier, and that it looks like some parts of the mesa are uh, desertifying. As much of an ecological tragedy as that is for the pines themselves, it also makes this area look a lot more like it would have when it was cleared for agriculture. There's another kiva, and sure enough, there's the stone for ventilation, just like the cliff palace. Imagine being in this tower and just shimmying down that little hole and right into that kiva. Like the box forts I used to build when I was a kid. Uh, what a pleasant place to live. And that view. I'm also told that this, uh, this cold air and thunderstorm that came in last night are actually very rare around here. So that just increases the evidence for my theory that the rain has been following me. Uh, well, this is my last... Uh, my last place where it matters. In Santa Fe, I'll be doing a lot of stuff indoors. Although I guess I am going to Bandelier, so oh my lord, if it rains in Bandelier, I'll know conclusively that the rain god has it out for me. Now I got an hour-ish long drive out to Weatherill Mesa. Look at these butterballs. After a paunch bloating lunch, I am here on Weatherill Mesa, walking toward the start of the Long House Tour. There's a little bit less development here. Uh, the roads are made for walking, not for cars, and uh, the trails are a lot longer, so 
this water bottle, which has been through actually hell and back with me by now, is getting one more good use before I call it a day on this trip. <laughs> Ladder time. I haven't confirmed it with anyone, but hearsay is these are not the original ladders either. So I was wondering where all the other roof beams went. Found them. And there's that same airflow regulator. Seems pretty universal. Oh, and here's a roof partially intact. And in the very back, there is a spring coming down through the cleft in the rock, which apparently would have made a fantastic water source. And look at this. Here is smoke, or at least soot, along the walls just like at Walnut Canyon. And look at this kiva. If I didn't know any better, I'd say that there was a hole in that entryway right there that goes deeper down. What a tiny little tunnel to crawl through. So this one's a little bit later date than Cliff Palace, but it was abandoned at around the same time. It's not clear why they started building these underneath the overhangs when there was still space up on the mesa. But a good guess is that there was a little bit of tension going on due to the droughts that eventually ended up completely destroying the sites. That maybe people just wanted to be a little bit, you know, more isolated, safer, harder to get at. I feel it. War. There's another Tesla in the park and there's only one charger. Which means I gotta finish up all the things I'm seeing and get back to that charger first. Or I'm gonna be spending a lot more time on that mountain than I want to. Oh look, as a uh, University of Wisconsin alumnus, it's good to know that my people were here. Look at the size of this thing. This dates to around 650 CE and was part of the basket maker culture, which is sort of the, uh, the culture that preceded the Pueblo back when they were still figuring out sedentary lifestyles like agriculture. It's, uh, it's thought that they dug about four to five feet into the ground, and then if you look at that rim with all the holes around it, they, uh, they put up posts and they supported a roof using those post holes in the, uh, in the floor. Then they covered it over with dirt and detritus. And they had a nice little sunken home here. It's certainly a lot bigger than the, uh, than the ones built out of bricks from later eras, but significantly less complex. Almost as if uh, moving through time, here is a slightly later version, which is actually considered to be a first Pueblo period house, around 800. It is a precursor to the ones we saw under the hills and that we saw this morning. And they formed all these rooms in one long line and lived here for several generations of one family. And of course, there's a giant pit house type thing over here. But instead of uh, serving the purposes of the old pit house, this actually seems to have behaved more like a kiva. Um, those blocky bits over there are actually not excavated. Look at this tower over at the Badger House. This was actually built around 1260, 1263, which would have coincided with the abandonment of many of the uh, lower sites. So whatever caused the building of this tower was maybe related to what caused the abandonment of the other sites. Meanwhile, this is the Badger House, roughly contemporaneous with the, uh, the Farview community and lasting as long as the end of the entire Mesa Verde period. It was uh, essentially built like Middle Eastern settlements where it was one set of structures built up and then knocked down to put other structures on top of it. And here are two enormous kivas alongside it. This small ruin is the Two Raven House and the last stop on the Badger Community Trail. It was occupied from around uh, 900 to around 1150. So 
abandoned shortly before everything else uh, started to fall apart. Apparently 15 people lived here, and it seems rather small for that, but I guess, you know, when, you, uh, when you're used to being cozy and maybe when there's another story on top, it's just fine. It's like a dorm. Correction. Apparently it was started around 850, so 50 years earlier than I said. That's, uh, that's 300 years, enough time for a number of generations, 15 or so. Imagine knowing that you're great, 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 grandfather had lived somewhere beneath your feet. This is what desertification looks like. The trees don't grow back. It's raining. I was right all along. It is following me. The curse is real. I don't know what I did wrong. And I don't know how to fix it. Fortunately, my last destination is under an overhang. Try to get me down here. The step house. Look at that. An actual staircase to get up that side of the cliff. Most of the time they just used either ladders or uh, actual toe holds and handholds carved into the rock, but that's a staircase apparently. Meanwhile, these are a series of pit houses. This one was uh, reconstructed a little back in the 60s and some of them have been shored up, but these actually date to uh, the early 600s, indicating that basket maker folks were here long before the big Pueblo structure was built. Look at this. Petroglyphs on the walls. The, uh, the modern Pueblo folks claim that these have to do with um, clan designations and migration. But uh, it's just really interesting that while this wall is loaded with petroglyphs, I, uh, I've seen almost none anywhere else since I got here. Maybe they were like modern day parents and they were like kids. No crayon on the walls. Okay, I know they said that all of these, uh, these windows were doorways, but how did anybody fit through that hole? Or that one up there. It's like the size of my head. I'm thinking these people had windows. Look at that, a little mano and matate just hanging out there. I wonder who was the last person to touch that. Eh, probably an excavator. Yeah, nobody's fitting through that hole. But my camera can. Well, I'm a little spooked about my ability to win the big Tesla race because, uh, this camera battery combo is not waterproof, and it really is pouring out. This came out of nowhere, too. Like, there was not a rain cloud in the sky, and then boom. There's a little waterfall there. I bet there used to be a cistern right down there in the woods where all that water's tumbling now. Uh, so much rain coming down here, it's starting to sheet off the rocks. It's giving me real Smoky Mountain vibes. Eventually, I just decided to walk through the rain. Uh, so I did, and I protected the GoPro under my shirt, so it was just fine. Yeah, the, uh, the non-waterproof characteristic of the battery stick is really haunting me when I'm being chased by the rain god for park after park after park. But, uh, yep, so now I'm on my way back, just hoping that I beat the other guy. And if I don't, I'll, uh, I'll, I don't know what I'll do. I'll ask the, uh, the lodge management to send him an email and say, hey there, I'm going to need a little charge before I head out tomorrow because I don't have quite enough to comfortably make it all the way to the next charger. And I sure as hell do not want to be stuck here all morning while I wait for him to get up and leave. And away we go. Well, the rain came back, but on the plus side, so did the views. Jackpot. All right, I'm gonna go let the front desk know who I am and that I've plugged in, so if the other guy needs some charge, he knows who to call. And then it's time to hunker down for a little bit. So you couldn't tell during the storm last night, but I can see now why they call this place Far View Lodge. That is a far view. As I traipse around on my drying tent. So the rain cleared up around six o'clock. There's still a little bit of lightning over in the, uh, in the east, but right now I can see a handful of stars and the moon amid some hazy clouds. 
Uh, I was really hoping for a clear night, because this was my last chance for stargazing. But I guess I'll always have the Grand Canyon. And I'll always have next year. Speaking of which, I should probably go to bed. I got a uh, about six hours of drive tomorrow off to Santa Fe. I accidentally charged the car up to 100%, which is not healthy, so I'm going to have to burn that off as fast as I can. And uh, I probably won't have to stop at any chargers on the way there either because of that. So it's going to be a quick journey. Until then, good night.